All right, go ahead, call the city council meeting to order. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, Jeff, will you please call the roll? Yes, Councillor Peetzold. Here. Councillor Smallwood. Here. Councillor Sheldon. Here. Councillor Walker. Here. Councillor Exner. Here. Councillor Hopinson. Here. Mayor Pulliam. Here. All right, well, let's go ahead and get this going. I'll start with a review of tonight's agenda. Um, we will call for any changes to the agenda. We'll then go to public comment. There is no submitted public comment, either online or in person this evening. We'll then go to the consent agenda that has our city council meeting minutes from our November 15th uh, meeting, a memorandum of understanding for a water purchase agreement, as well as resolution 2021-34 on the transfer of jurisdiction of Southeast Crescent Lane. Under resolutions, we have a public uh, hearing resolution 2021-23 adopting changes to our system development charges. Under old business, we have our Sandy Net business IGA with Clackamas broadband exchange discussion. Under new business, we have planning commission appointments, comprehensive plan consult contract approval, as well as police body worn cameras update and purchase authorization. We'll then round up our evening with our uh, report from our city manager and our committee and council reports. With that, is there any um, changes to tonight's agenda? Mayor? Yes, sir. I'd like to pull the uh which was on the consent agenda, pull up the memorandum of understanding for the water purchase agreement for a brief conversation, if we could. Um, oh, there must be a reason later. we can't just have the conversation within the consent agenda That's portion fine. of the agenda. That's fine. Okay, cool. Any other suggested changes to the, to the agenda? All right. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's no public comment suggested, uh, submitted. So we'll go ahead and go to the consent agenda. I'm now open for discussion. I think Councillor Hokinson might have something on the water purchase agreement. I'm just, I was trying to refresh our memory on the, the nature of the decision we made to pursue not joining and why we still have to be part of the MOA if we're not going to immediately be back in or we're looking to maybe pursue an alternate. Or is this just a dual pass strategy? Essentially, you know, the council's decision was um, out of the two options was to um, connect to uh, basically buy untreated bull run raw water and treat our own um, with our own treatment facility. Okay. But then in the interim, explore additional uh, water options such as groundwater um, to bolster our sources. This MIU is basically to negotiate towards a new agreement, which Portland has notified that they want to do. Um, we have until like 2028, but they, they didn't find your notice. And so this is basically just saying, hey, we're all going to work together to negotiate what a new agreement for our wholesale um, customers is going to be. And at the time we pulled it was because we had the council had not made that decision yet on you know connecting, not connecting, building our own treatment. So 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 I have I have some concerns. I have some concerns about entering into an MOU unless the MOU literally in the way I thought I read it is not the case, but literally means nothing other than that we're agreeing to potentially agree down the road. Um, because without any knowledge of what this filtration plant that they're putting in is going to cost and knowing that the ratepayers will bear the burden of a right now one billion dollar and rising project. Also knowing that Tualatin Valley, Gresham, Troutdell, and a few other areas have pulled out of Portland water, that the number of people that then they can charge for that filtration plant becomes much smaller. So knowing that we've already increased our rates, knowing that Portland will be increasing their rates, but is unwilling to say how much those will be, I'm not real happy, I'm not real comfortable with saying anything with Portland. So I guess it, it just goes back to our last past discussion. I was like, what alternatives do we have though? Well, and we were gonna look at looking at those alternatives. And I think we had this conversation four or five months ago yep. and here we are again. Yep. So where are we in that process? A, and I realize it's not been that much time, but I also know that this contract is good till 2028. That's, is, is it with this MOU or is it going to be terminated early? It'll be terminated early because um, 
Portland has given notice, it's, so they, it's a five-year notice. So I think the expiration, expiration date of the current agreement is in 2026. This doesn't commit us, remember. Okay. This is just to start negotiations. The council can reject the agreement, you know, before when after we negotiate something. I think. Well, I didn't think I didn't think it committed us. I wasn't worried about that. Yeah. But I, you know. Our, our position, I think the council would agree, is that that exact thing, recognizing that the infrastructure for buying uh, raw bull run water is significantly less than, say, the infrastructure needed to pump it across, you know, the metro area sure. to other wholesale. Yeah. And so we would want to negotiate to make sure that our rates are reasonable to take that into consideration that, you know, we're, we're just, it's one pipeline, it's right there. You know, we shouldn't have to pay for the infrastructure to, to hold water and, and uh, move it to across the metro. Yeah, I just I don't I don't want us to get in a in a position, and I know that we've already given direction to look at alternatives, but I don't want to find us in a position where we sign this MOU. This is this is the direction that we go down, and in four years we're looking at crazy rates coming out of Portland, and we have no option. That's what I don't want. I guess included with that is, is that if we don't think that the raw water that comes from Bull Run is acceptable by either expenses or taste or quality and so on, that we have the option to look at other places as well. I, I want to keep my options open as much as possible. I guess that's as long as that MOU that you're talking about here does that, I'm okay with that. But I, I think we got to look at at least have as many of the variable options open to us as we can. Because it may not be that we want that will run water, maybe some of the other solutions. Can I ask more about, about the termination about date? Sure. So the MOU list, the earliest, what is it, the earliest termination date, is that how it phrases it? Earliest contract termination being 6-30-2028 for Sandy, but you mentioned Portland's already exercised their five-year right. Does that mean, how, how do we reconcile 28 with 26? You want the new agreement in place by 2026. Mike, what, what's the super, we're, we're still okay until 2028, but yet they want a new agreement for everybody by 2026, is that how? They'd like to, the city, they can't pull the trigger on the five-year clock until um, I think August of 2023. So we're the, I think one other wholesale customer has a different schedule. All the other wholesale customers had to make a decision in June of 2021, and they have. And this and this doesn't obligate the city to buy water from their treatment plant, from from Bull Run, from City of Portland. This just says that if we they're negotiating all their wholesale agreements, and they want to have one wholesale agreement for all users, and they're cut, getting rid of the 2017 or 18 kind of custom agreements that every user has. So they want to consolidate it. So this doesn't obligate us to buy treated water from city of Portland. And, and as Councillor um, Hokanson pointed out, it doesn't even obligate us to buy untreated water, any water from city of Portland. It just authorizes us. It says we're going to participate in negotiating the new contract language. So I, I guess my, my qualification, I'm happy that we have this 28 day because that gives us to 628 to figure out what our plan B is or A and whether that's yeah. building a pipeline out to get unfiltered water or whatever. Um, and I guess the, the I'm fine with the MOA. I just don't want to see us have that MOA make us make a decision on 2026 when everybody else signs that would terminate our other Give, that would basically take two years off our agreement. That, that I don't want to see. So as you do your negotiations, you got to figure out how to keep that yeah. option open. I think we will be um, on our way towards our solution, whether that's expanding mm -hmm. new sources or building a treatment facility at that mm -hmm. time. Right. right. Okay. Okay. Is there a motion? adopt the consent agenda. Make a motion that we approve our consent agenda. Is there a second? I'll second it. There's a motion by Councillor Pizold and a second by Councillor Elkinson. Man, you guys are making me work. Uh, all those in favor <laughs> signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nays. Motion carries. Uh, moving forward to resolutions. We have public hearing uh, 2021-33. I will open this public hearing. 
2021-33 at 742. Uh, Mike, do you have a staff report? Uh, yes, you know, as the council uh, knows, uh, and as and, and and as we have seen over the past couple of months, construction prices are rising, and at a pretty good clip. And so, you know, we do this every year where we update our systems development charges based on a uh, recognized index. The state statute that governs STCs allows cities to do this. It's built into our methodology. We did it. Uh, last year about this time. And so uh, I can't remember what the change was last year, um, but uh, this year, you know, the change since, since the last time we've done this, it's been 6.24% in the index for all three uh, SDCs that are subject to it. And uh, we recommend that um, we keep this index or we keep the SDCs updated at least annually so we can keep up with rising construction costs uh, because they will most certainly be higher than they are now. At the, t you know, the plan horizon on some of these capital projects goes out 20 years. And uh, in the transportation system plan has a 20 year horizon. The wastewater master plan have, has a 20 year horizon. So we wanna make sure that we keep up with these, with construction costs by adjusting it annually. All right, thank you, Mike. Um, so now we'll go to public testimony. Please try to avoid repetition if someone else has already expressed the same thoughts. It is sufficient to state that you agree with the statements of a previous speaker, even if that is all that you say. For those joining us in person this evening, please raise your hand to indicate that you'd like to speak and wait to be recognized. If you're participating online, click the raised hand button and wait to be recognized. If you're participating via telephone, dial star nine to raise your hand and wait to be recognized. I'll call on each person when it's their turn to speak. Each participant will receive up to three minutes to testify. Jeff will let you know when you have 20 seconds remaining. Our, our city council rules require each person states their name and address for the record. All right, are there, uh, I will now call for any testimony on this proposal. Okay, Mayor, I'll just take a look at the list for any raised hands. And Mayor, I do not see any raised hands. All right, Mike, do you have a uh, staff recap and recommendation? Uh, just, uh, I did notice a, a um, mistake in the staff report there under the uh, budgetary impact. I use a canned staff report for these, and this is last year's, and I updated, I thought I updated all the numbers, but I did not update the um, revenue, projected revenue increases under the budgetary impact um, heading and it would be a 6.24% increase instead of a 6.1%. But the numbers, the biennial increases in that um, paragraph are correct. It's just the percentage amount is off by a little bit. Sir, I'm now calling for a motion to close the public hearing. Make a motion to close the public hearing. There's a second. Second. A motion by Councillor Pietzold and a second by Councillor Exner to close the public hearing. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nays. Motion carries. All right. Discussion. Inflation's high. Let's keep up with it. Yeah, we've done this every year. I mean, we didn't used to do this, and it was part of the we talked about, you know, years ago, Colts are not doing it until we need it. If we asked the council asked. Hey, let's kind of do this more regularly. So that's the history behind it because we didn't used to do that. And we have had to play catch up in the past. So, mm -hmm. uh, so it's good to stay having these leapfrogs. All right. So our motion to adopt resolution 2021 33. I'll make a resolution. I'll make a motion. Your resolute. Motion. <laughs> 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 resolution. I make a motion to approve resolution 2021-33 and direct staff to make changes to the master fee schedule to reflect the adjustments to the transportation water and sewer system development charges. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second. There's a motion by Councillor uh, Walker, a second by Councillor Sheldon. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nays. Motion carries. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mike. Um, next, under old business, Sandy Net, Biz uh, Sandy Net Business IGA with Clackamas uh, Broadband Exchange. Uh, Jordan? 
Yeah, and so Greg Booster, IT, Sandy Dead Director, will be presenting the, the business plan uh, and this IGA. This is the second time um, uh, this item has uh, been in front of council, um, but the major change here is, as you've seen in the, the staff report in the council packet, um, uh, Greg put together the, the business plan as requested by council. Uh, um, the council had a number of questions about the IGA and sort of the, the intent and uh, more uh, the, the business plan behind it um, in terms of revenues, expenses, the costs and benefits of uh, this arrangement, this partnership with CBX. So I want to just thank Greg for putting in the time and, and effort and, and putting together this business plan. It, he put a lot of work and detail into this plan. And um, I know how busy they are as a department too, to be able to pull this together while also uh, making sure that our, our town has great high speed internet and are being connected. Um, so my thanks to Greg and, and also to the Sandy Net Advisory Board um, for, for reviewing this uh, at least a few times. I know it's been in front of them um, to, to provide input and a recommendation to the city council. So um, Greg, I know you have a presentation and we're going to highlight some things, but I'll hand it off to you now. All right. Thank you, Jordan. And good evening, council. Um, I am back to um, kind of revise uh, in addition to the IGA from last time. Um, I have prepared a business plan which uh, should lay out uh, various options and kind of our, our plan for uh, should we enter into an intergovernmental agreement with uh, Clackamas County here. So I do have a slideshow that I will go ahead and uh, pull up on the screen here for every, everyone. And uh, I'll kind of just take it away. And so this slideshow is a kind of a deviation of the uh, staff report, which is actually a more revised uh, version of the executive summary uh, in the business plan itself there. So while parts of it might seem a little bit redundant here, I'm hoping some visuals will, uh, will kind of help uh, show some other pieces that might not be available just on paper there. So. Uh, kind of diving into kind of the purpose and objectives, uh, I'll cover a couple quick key points here. Um, one of the, the main purposes and drives for uh, us looking at a, uh, an IGA and a, a kind of a partnership with uh, CBX is for us to kind of grow our medium and large customer base um, within uh, for SandyNet, um, which are more businesses that kind of exist uh, currently outside of the city limits. Uh, the few that are within city limits are uh, tend to be higher chains or those that might prefer um, a larger national provider or something. And so we are looking at uh, various areas that offer uh, those medium and large businesses that would cater towards having a very competitive uh, uh, price uh, and reliability for their service. And those that are uh, within a decent range of Clackamas County's existing network, uh, making it e uh, easy to hook up and, and utilize. And using additional revenue, which is uh, a very big main driver for this project, um, is used to increase uh, funding for various different sources. Um, it can be used to fund additional FTEs uh, and employees, which uh, would allow us to cross train, uh, but also just continue to add to our overall capacity um, and you know, allow certain individuals to do things and join their weekends and also uh, uh, being able to not constantly be running at 100%, uh, which can happen at times when there's just the, the certain level of crew. So. Working towards uh, is always a goal of our team to be able to do uh, work right correctly uh, to reduce having to do repetitive or repeated work um, and make sure that we're taking our time and doing it correctly the first time there. Um, but it also plays into being able to offer certain things that we currently don't uh, have the ability to do, which are things such as we can support or off hours or even holiday, whether it's done through an employee or a contracting company um, call centers for basic uh, questions and customer support do exist and are, are highly popular uh, for that specific reason where you just need to answer some general questions, uh, major issues, things like that are always handled by your on-call team and a lot of issues get resolved um, uh, on next business day uh, when, uh, when staff returns back to the office there. And probably most importantly uh, is paying down uh, existing debts. Uh, which is uh, Sandy Net does have after uh, it did expand and build out a fiber optic network uh, to past every home in Sandy. Uh, it, it does have a revenue bond that it's been paying across and Sandy Net has continued to expand since then. So it's, uh, it's in the best interest, obviously, to uh, get your uh, debts paid off as soon as possible and 
we see this as a potential option that the sooner that those debts can be paid off, the sooner that we can look at reinvesting not only in these also uh, these options that I've listed before, but also uh, additional ones which are in the business plan, but not for the sake of uh, this conversation or uh, what I'm presenting on right now. So what we are aiming to do is uh, work with CBX uh, to provide fiber optic services to businesses that are outside of our current uh, serving territory um, and within Clackamas County. Uh, and we would be charging uh, $225 a monthly recurring cost for gigabit symmetrical service. Um, and of that, our split revenue is 53 to 47, uh, where we get to maintain and keep $120 a month and CBX would have $105 uh, each month there. And so hopefully that you guys can see this map here, uh, but this is a map of somewhat recent of CBX's uh, current fiber optic network. And as you can see, they do own a lot of uh, assets uh, across the county there, and they do offer a ring, but they do go through uh, major towns and, and cities in this area here. And upon discussing with the uh, program uh, director uh, or program manager over at CBX, uh, it is estimated uh, that their current fiber optic network passes about 4,000 businesses within 1,000 feet of their existing lines. So there definitely are a lot of businesses in Clackamas County, but uh, these numbers were originally calculated when Sandina attempted to uh, file for a, a grant uh, through the EDA grant back in the summer of 2020 uh, to do a similar project, uh, especially after um, some of the effects of COVID had just hit. And so uh, unfortunately, we weren't re were not re rewarded any funds for that there. And so quickly, we began to look at additional options to be able to do this ourselves. Um, and during the uh, January and February of 2021, um, we worked on coming up with an IGA that mutually met uh, both of our, our needs and, uh, and sought to find a way to be able to make this project a reality. And so um, one of the big pieces is obviously, uh, and it's, it's defined in the IGA, is to separate the requirements and the responsibilities of each party here. So between Sandina and CBX, um, from being kind of a service provider, I'd say that we have about four major legs that support uh, our entire operation. And that is our customer support, uh, the ability to uh, send out bills and receive funds, and then manage the network uh, on top of your existing physical plant, which is the fiber optic. Now, SandyNet has a lot of plant, uh, an outside plant itself within city limits. Um, and Clackamas County, obviously, from the picture has a lot more. Um, but based on the way the IGA is and how you see the split ratio between the, uh, the revenue is that it's, uh, it's meant to uh, support those, uh, those uh, areas or those centers. And so CBX does uh, maintain and in the IGA is defined as maintaining, owning and operating, upgrading uh, the fiber optic network uh, that they have. Uh, includes building it out uh, for additional customers and as they continue, uh, continue to grow. And for the Sandinet side, um, we would continue to do our customer support, which we uh, already do uh, for, uh, well, we do all of these operations, but for uh, our Sandinet and residential business customers inside city limits already, handle billing uh, and our network operations, which means connecting us upstream to other providers and to the internet as a whole. And so to dive into some of the costs here, because it's, uh, it's very important to make sure you're not looking at a, a project that's not going to make money uh, with the intent of paying down debts, um, I will kind of briefly go over kind of some of the installation costs uh, and our operational expenses. Um, I've admitted capital expenditures. There are some minor ones uh, for infrastructure, which are rolled into the operational expenses that I will explain. Uh, but we'll start kind of with the non-recurring one-time installation costs, which is uh, uh, includes direct materials, direct labor, and the overhead, essentially. So your basic uh, pieces for building a cost. And so your direct materials are going to be looking at your, your equipment. It's going to be looking at optics, um, pieces that are needed to connect to that network uh, and get it set up. The direct labor is going to be the, um, the installer going out uh, in, the, in their time to travel and install the equipment. And then the overhead includes uh, administration, uh, talking to the customer, filling out service requests, provisioning the equipment with the network engineer, turn up uh, those pieces as well. And then in addition, uh, those all start to start adding up in costs there. 
there is a one-time installation cost that is billed out to the customer of $500. Um, and in addition to $500, there is a minimum 12 month term that the customer uh, signs into uh, to guarantee that we do uh, break even and make money off of a customer should they decide to not stay as a customer past 12 months there. So the idea of the installation cost is to bring that break even point down uh, from where it was before. Um, and then in addition to the term guarantees that we're not putting ourselves at unnecessary risk uh, when we start adding customers. Now, from the operational expenses, these are our monthly expenses and pieces that tie into that each customer we add does add an expense to the network uh, to be able to support and maintain. Um, and those would include things like power, co-location, or uh, space to be able to house equipment, um, IP addresses that we... I just did a forced mute. We can... Hey, Greg, a uh, question from council here. I just... Sorry, Greg. Sorry, to clarify your installation costs, so the customer pays $500 and we end up covering an additional $389 of the installation cost. And yeah, um, out of the next several months worth of uh, fees, is that what I'm understanding? Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, out of the uh, the total cost of direct materials, labor, and overhead, you subtract the installation cost, and that gives you the remaining that would be paid off through um, the revenue minus operational costs until it breaks even. So, um, and it's in a, it's in a further slide, but the break even point is about uh, three and a half months um, before uh, you start making actual profit on the customer there. You, you pay monthly for three and a half months. That's about the break even point. And then we start going into pure profit. Pretty much. Um, I mean, the cost of the vehicles to get there, the cost of the facility. The, that's, that's, over that's, all all in, in. that's all in this. Yeah. No, it's on page uh, 25 of this report. It's, it's... The breakdown for the operational and installation costs are exhibits B, C, and uh, D is revenue. So that's pages 50 and 51, I believe. Uh, that would show the, the cost for equipment and then the activity of travel time and installation time required, uh, what we predict to be on average uh, for these. And so the, um, and I can, I can dive into these a little bit here, is that based on the roles on which uh, Sandina and uh, CBX are operating, the, um, the amount of uh, installation required from our team would be very minimal, a matter of pro programming a switch in the office, driving it out there and plugging it in. It is the, re uh, the responsibility of Clackamas County to provide uh, tested and operational uh, fiber uh, already at the premise that we can interface with uh, simply. So there's actually very little work besides simply taking existing equipment that we've already programmed, mounting it, turning it up and verifying, and then being on our way. At that point, the, um, the, you know, it would either be a contractor or a internal IT department that would most likely perform the cutover uh, when their team is ready to uh, make the switch from their existing provider uh, to us. And I will, um, if that's uh, answered the question, I can move back over to uh, kind of the operational expenses here. And um, I apologize, I don't think my camera was showing that entire time. So I'm sorry, you're just staring at a, a screen here. Um, but the operational expenses are what it's going to cost us to be able to serve that customer on a month to month basis. Um, and so, uh, the, it's broken out into two pieces here uh, because uh, I do want to touch on a little bit of risk that's uh, potentially here. Um, we do look at uh, being able to use an excess uh, of ports that we already have in our network. Excess are ports that are currently uh, unutilized on our devices that uh, we have no intention of using, um, but are already there and paid for. For example, um, you might put a switch out at a location or inside of a data center or closet that you might utilize to 70%. And the remaining ports are available because you buy switches in a certain number of ports 
or that, that, that equipment, but you don't utilize it fully. So those ports are available to be utilized, uh, but are currently and don't have any active plans to be utilized. And so we do have a, uh, a few ports that are available for us to utilize towards the beginning where we could add up to 34 customers before we actually have to purchase additional hardware and IP transit or upstream internet service uh, to handle additional load. And so that's why it's broken out into two pieces up until 34 customers. Each customer has a monthly operational cost of $15 to include power, co-location costs, and upstream provider costs. And then once we get above 34 customers and, and have to purchase additional hardware, uh, that cost uh, following that we add customers in a, in a proper uh, fashion and meet our projections would be at $25 a customer. Now, when you purchase a, a new piece of hardware and it's the first customer on it, that customer is bearing the entire cost of that split across the lifespan of the hardware. But as you add additional customers, that operational cost will continue to drop. So, which means that after we hit 34 customers, it's important that at that point, when we, we sit back and look and say, do we need, do we continue on this? Do we reevaluate it? We have the option to be able to assess and add some of these customers uh, with uh, very little risk to be able to really sit back and make sure that we are, uh, we are getting what we're looking for essentially. And I think that uh, before we, we look at that, we can also reevaluate some of these uh, recurring costs and adjust these and uh, knowing them a little bit differently and also adjusting based on when exactly that time frame would be. As we look at the, uh, the revenue projection chart, we wouldn't hit those 34 customers until January of the third year, uh, which means that um, prices could drop, uh, you know, inflation could change, all of those pieces there. So it gives us a chance to really kind of reevaluate and the formulas are there already to kind of just plug in the numbers and see where it comes out. So the moving on to kind of the revenue projection graph here, uh, this does take into account that we have added, we add 34 customers before we purchase additional hardware. Uh, you will see that the profit line does dip after the 34th customer because of that additional hardware and then we'll continue to grow there on out. Um, that is the point where you do have to purchase additional hardware. Um, and then this is projecting that we add a total of 90 customers, which is the max amount of customers for this particular hardware that we have planned to use um, would allow for. And we have said that we set a goal of five years to add 90 customers, which is to grow at 1.5 customers a month or two customers every three months. Um, and the pricing in this does include an annual 3% inflation uh, on those operating costs that can inflate uh, things like electricity, um, and transit costs, uh, but things like the actual equipment costs, once it's purchased, we're simply making sure that, that we're paying for the, that equipment across its lifespan. So certain ones reflect that 3%, other pieces don't necessarily need to. And uh, this information does not show that customers that may or may not cancel. Um, this also would include things like, uh, and one of the risks is also looking at cust uh, businesses that may or may not um, go under or close up shop. And uh, for that reason, obviously you're, uh, uh, you would see some cancellations there, but from my experience uh, uh, working with businesses in Sandy is that when you provide a competitive uh, environment and price, uh, unless they have a really bad experience, customers are likely to stick with you. So I wouldn't think that it would be out of the question for a customer to stick with us multiple years. And when you do look at cancellations and adding additional customers, you're simply looking at um, installation costs, but also potentially the reuse of certain hardware in certain cases. So you can actually reduce it in, in some areas there. So coming kind of to the last slide uh, of these analysis pieces, uh, we come to the break-even point, which does come to about three and a half months, um, actually closer to the April side there to, uh, with including the $500 installation cost before we start making a uh, profit on that customer. So this graph represents that if we hooked a customer up in January, by April, we are making a uh, profit off that customer. Minimum of a 12 year agreement, or sorry, 12 month agreement uh, would allow us to make sure that we've covered our bases and made it worth our time to be able to add that customer uh, should they ever cancel after the first 12 months. And finally, uh, a couple last pieces. They aren't in the slide here, so I can actually go ahead and stop sharing. Uh, are that um, 
this IGA also has a couple of pieces regarding to uh, termination, making sure that we're trying to take into account as much risk as possible and minimizing it. Uh, the termination pieces in the IGA um, allow us to be able to quickly and easily um, terminate an agreement should we need to for any reason whatsoever, whether uh, uh, for any number of reasons. Um, but it also allows us uh, not underneath the termination, but to kind of pick and choose. This is designated to be a partnership or working with the other entity, uh, which means that we have the ability to uh, pick and choose uh, if a customer is worth adding. And so uh, likewise, if we bring forth the county uh, an opportunity or a customer that wishes to connect to the network, the county gets to make the decision on whether or not they actually can build out to it or want to build out to it, or if it's feasible, and we have the same option as well. And so if, and I forgot to mention it earlier when it's kind of separating these roles here is that what this kind of role is set up as is what you common see, uh, commonly call an open access model, where somebody owns a network, uh, typically a fiber optic network, and then leases out pieces of it to um, other companies or people that of interest that would like to utilize it. And doing so, that's what Clackamas County uh, does is they own a fiber optic network, but they also lease out a lot of these um, these pieces of fiber to other customers of theirs and other entities. So we have the ability to ride across it just like anybody else does. What this partnership allows us to really do is uh, work on um, providing that service uh, and meeting kind of the needs and, and what we're looking uh, what the county kind of has a mission for and what we kind of have a mission for. And so I think it has an opportunity uh, for us to really kind of work together, play on our strengths and, uh, and kind of generate uh, a, a decent level of revenue that would help us uh, grow ourselves here and uh, achieve kind of that overarching goal of being self-sustaining. So with all of this said, um, I would like to present uh, the recommendation that we have here, uh, which is uh, has that this plan in IGA has been reviewed by the Sandy Net Advisory Board. Um, and was approved uh, to bring before city council with the recommendation to enter into a government or advise, sorry, authorize the city manager to uh, enter into an intergovernmental agreement with CBX to provide ISP business services to customers in Clackamas County. And the decision that uh, I would like to uh, have council uh, discuss and decide is uh, upon reviewing the proposed IGA and business plan that uh, we respectfully request that council decide uh, if the proposed venture is a feasible and acceptable solution that moves Sandy Net towards its direction or goal of continuing to grow and make it self-sufficient long-term. Thank you. Great, thank you and a great presentation, Greg. Very appreciated. A lot of work obviously went into that uh, with you and your team. So thank you. Any questions for Greg? I'd just like to say something. Okay, we'll start with Don. Thanks. Hey, Greg. Good job. Thank you. I mean, I know I was kind of hard on your last presentation, and, and this does show a lot of good work, a lot of good thinking. And and in our hallway conversations, it sounded like you got some value out of spending the time on this as well. So um, I'm, I'm appreciative of that. So well done. And thank you. That's great. Carl. Real quick. Uh, Greg, is there any, any risk in this at all? Uh, do we need to do some insurancing, that sort of thing? Uh, there's costs in that kind of area that uh, somebody makes a mistake, um, breaks something, those kinds of things. Are there some uh, uh, unreasonable or I wouldn't say unreasonable uh, costs in that area? Um, yeah, so I did, uh, I did kind of look into a little bit on insurance and increased travel risks, uh, which would happen considering that there is additional travel uh, outside of city limits uh, currently. And upon looking at the risk uh, and uh, seeing what potential additional risk came from traveling or uh, tr uh, there, uh, it kind of was determined that the additional cost or additional risk was marginal enough that it didn't really have too much of an impact on it. Uh, from a travel perspective. And now the liability pieces, um, I could think of a few here, but um, I won't be able to necessarily tackle all of them, but uh, uh, you know, you'll always find more liabilities, I'm sure. Uh, but uh, there's always risk of obviously uh, personnel injury, uh, but also failing hardware that can cause disruptions, um, electrocution, uh, harm from lasers. These are all things that 
uh, we already take on with our fiber optic network that are just uh, uh, in addition uh, that may translate to a, a business. Improper installation of equipment uh, can, uh, can cause risks. So the ways that we saw about uh, minimizing these risks is making sure that we're following uh, proper code installation that uh, we're wiring uh, and hooking up our equipment correctly so it can't be tripped upon or that everything is grounded uh, and that the power is clean when it comes in so that we reduce the chance of electric, uh, electrical failures uh, as much as possible, um, making sure that we're securing fiber and locations um, and making sure that our, our employees and techs have all the proper safety equipment to reduce as much personal risk to them. <laughs> Obviously you've investigated it. So uh, that they and all the rest of it is just great. <laughs> Good job. That's great. <laughs> Thank you, right. Greg. Uh, Kathleen. Um, so this is a really good start to answering some of the questions that I think I had at the last time. Um, it's not really a business plan for SandyNet, which I think is something we really desperately need. Um, because I think you know you guys do such a great job and you're working so hard, but coming up with the kind of the neutral outside third party analysis of what all the costs are involved in your operations is something that's probably missing here. So so things that kind of come to mind when I look at this, and I'm not trying to be critical, but I am trying to kind of point out things that I I think we underestimate how much service we're providing. You know the the paying the, the bill collector, you know, the, the folks that do all the billing, that wasn't included in any of the costs that I could see. Um, charging for the, um, the vehicles that they're driving out there. You had the gas costs in there, but not the vehicles at all. Um, the cost for the labor was like, you know, 33 bucks an hour, which is not at all anywhere near the cost to government, including your, you know, your insurance, your you know, OWCP and all the other costs to government. There, you know, there's an hourly rate that we pay people, but then there's also a cost to government that is usually about three times what the hourly salary is. Um, the, and, the, and then all this, I think that some of the equipment was in there, but I, you know, I don't have a good handle on what other equipment is out there to, to make this happen. But, the, but those are all kind of costs and, and well, there's just the facilities too. I mean, you all don't pay any facility rent right now out at the bunk, or the annex building or whatever it's called. And um, so, so those are all kind of things that, you know, when we do a business plan for the Sandy Net, I, I hope that we can kind of really accurately assess the cost for all that and figure out what we should be charging folks. And I think it's still gonna be competitive. Again, offer excellent service. That's your, you know, when you talked about marketing, that's your biggest marketing um, success story, um, you know, especially if you just pay any attention to Facebook, everybody, including myself, rave about you. Um, I'm curious about what the competitive costs are for, like, what is zip, zip fly uh, charging businesses? What is wave charging businesses? Um, you know, what are kind of what's the comparable rates i kind of looked them up for residential but it was a little harder to find out what those were for commercials for, uh, you know businesses um you know i don't think we need to charge as much as the other the competition but there shouldn't be any reason why we don't get close um especially since we're evidently splitting this 5347 or whatever it is with the county mm -hmm. it seems like most of the costs most the ongoing costs <laughs> involved in this. Obviously they have a, a big cost up front for getting the wire out there, but pretty much the ongoing costs, we're giving 43% of all the revenue that comes in for you know years to them. When they don't really, from what I can tell, have hardly any involvement once once you all do your job. I mean, help is that what, what are they doing like you know a year from now to a business? Obviously, if the wire gets crunched by something, they're out there to repair it after you assess that it's not on your side of the line. But is there a reason why they're collecting 43% every month? 
Uh, yeah, it's it's basically to pay off the the cost it takes to uh, install it and then uh, make uh, an additional revenue too. Is that they they'd be making revenue in addition to us making revenue there. So I I will say that for uh, for us to, to hook up uh, uh, customers is that we often uh, when bringing it out to the house don't make a don't make profit off that customer uh, until after a couple of years. And I use the term profit as in once all of our expenses are taken care of, uh, operational and capital uh, are paid off, that this is uh, additional uh, revenue that's not going towards an expense, essentially. And so the, uh, the same goes with them is that they still have a, a network to pay off after they build it, but also to continue uh, their expansion and uh, maintenance costs. They have FTEs to, to pay for as well. They have a large network to maintain. Um, and each, each customer that they are able to utilize and utilize that fiber to its fullest allows them to be able to either keep their costs low or continue that, that kind of expansion and work towards uh, their goals there. So when looking at kind of the cost breakdown here, and, and you're, you're right, I don't have a cost breakdown on this one for what we do for residential there. But for the first couple of years, all of that uh, money goes towards paying off the capital uh, construction there. And so that's obviously the huge cost for us is that when we hook a customer up, our break-even point is now a couple of years. And uh, while our break-even point with an installation cost uh, comes down to three and a half months, theirs is, is probably uh, at least a year, if not more out that before they would start making revenue. So they look at it as an investment on when they're looking to hook up a business and looking to keep them on longer than 12 months. Um, because they have all the capital burden on that uh, on that end there. So when I look at the split ratio compared to what we look about with the fiber network, I would say that they actually come in probably a little bit lower uh, because a, a lot of what we go into and a lot of the repairs that we end up doing and a lot of our uh, unforeseen costs tend to be uh, fiber related, whether it's infrastructure replacement and repair, uh, and that's all built into their cost and part of their responsibility. So uh, upon review and how I, we've operated our network, um, I think the amount that's allocated to them in that ratio is uh, perfectly acceptable. Well, um, what are the costs for purchase? So, so let's see. It just seems like there's a lot of costs that aren't really included in our side of the, the bank. Um, like I said, you know, the actual employee cost, government costs and the vehicles and the facilities and the, you know, the, the, the over, overhead costs that are, uh, and I get that some of that overhead was included. I appreciate that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. When you say that it's gonna take a half hour to hook everything up and then what we're talking about electrical wires and everything else, I've never had an electrician to my house where they weren't there at least an hour, but. Oh, I, I mean, we're not electricians either. There's nothing we can deal with uh, uh, in terms of voltage. Um, it's plugging in a cord to an outlet and then putting two screws in to hang a switch and then plugging the fiber in and waiting for it to boot up and then verifying that it connects up. And then after that, the part of the overhead cost is the network engineer reaching out to the customer's IT department to verify that they were able to cut service over successfully. That's the, go ahead. It does go to, for me, it goes to what is our mission. And, and I think it's, I appreciate the effort to kind of bring in more money. And I guess I'm also concerned about what, it, you know, what we're, we're looking at using that TARP money or CARES money or whatever it's called to hook up all these places in Sandy, right? A huge job for you, considering what you guys are already scrambling with what you've got on board right now. And that's a huge workload. And so then how does this, you know, affect that workload? Because those, that's really what I think our mission should be is, is focusing on those efforts. Um, how, does, how does this affect that? Um, well, if we're able to maintain our projection of adding 1.5 customers, um, it would take the number of hours for the installation technician and the, those in charge of overhead. So it's just a matter of uh, an additional couple of hours uh, that would be to hook up an additional customer. Um, and when you compare it towards uh, things like the level of revenue there is that it, it shows up as uh, yielding 
more revenue than it would uh, it would be normally. And so um, I can kind of put the numbers together here now, but it would be the additional time required would be the costs, uh, the overhead costs and the installation time uh, for the technicians uh, times 1.5 a month. And that's how much it, would, it should require if we if we're able to stick to it. And the time, the time to add it to our billing system and get them to pay their bill every month and when they're not paying and all that other stuff wasn't at all addressed either. But anyway, I, you know. And, yeah, I mean, uh, we could always go back through and add it into the into the overhead there. Um, but uh, from when I did look at it here uh, in, in researching it, the uh, ability and the extra cost that it adds on to uh, what we already uh, pay in terms of utility billing to add another customer to that uh, that record there would be it'd be sub one dollar um, you know per month per customer uh, essentially we already have you know thirty five hundred customers there an extra customer that follows the same process of uh, meeting the bill and paying for it um, based on uh, the the wage that we put into it there um, uh, I could we could come out with a, a an exact number for it I I don't have it readily available in front of me tonight. Well, thanks. I appreciate all the work you've done on this. It's a really great start. I really would like to see us do a master plan for Sandy Net that really looks at where are we going to go in the future, what areas are we going to try to focus services to, and 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 what's that going to cost, and how can we, like you, you know, meet the objectives that you lined out in your in your paper. I appreciate all that effort. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Any other questions? Ready to? Yeah. Sure. You just want to say thank you, Greg. Yep. Mm -hmm. Great job. This is amazing. I really know where you started from, where you've gone, and through the process of it. And not only did the Sanding Net uh, board uh, enthusiastically uh, love it and where you're going with it, and what is exciting about it. And I know that you grew a lot during this process and the questions there. Um, and uh, we'll be able to use this to feed into other projects as well. So I know that you built into that many nights, late into the nights, every night since the last time we saw this. So I just want to appreciate and recognize the hard work and just the love you have for Sandy Net and making sure that you've also um, gone um, and trying to find those ways that the council gave direction to being self-sufficient and paying that off. Because I know that at the root and the heart of it is where it's at. So, um, and just thank you for that. May, may I just add, um, you know, I think, Council really challenged um, Greg and Sandy Nat, you know, the last time he presented. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know how I necessarily felt about all that, but I certainly know how I feel about the outcome, which is I think like good on both. Um, you know, good on the counselors that pushed back and wanted to see a little bit more thoughtfulness and thoroughness and what we're doing with Sandy Nat and how we're thinking about it. But good on uh, Greg and, and Sandy Nat and, and your team for taking that challenge on in the manner in which you did and really jumping, you know, deep into it in the professional manner and the way you've conducted yourself and presented it tonight. I think it just speaks volumes about you and your department. Um, so I, I think this has really just ended up in a really good spot for all of us. That's something I need to be concerned with. Okay. Uh, with that, if, if there's not more, if there's more discussion, great. If not, well, we can also entertain a, uh, a motion. I'll make a motion that's, that the uh, that we authorize the uh, city manager to enter into an intergovernmental agreement with CBX to provide ISP business service to customers in Clackamas County. A second. There's a motion by Councillor Hokinson and a second by Councillor Smallwood. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nays. Nay. Motion carries. All right. Moving on. Thank you again, Greg. Really appreciate it. Um, moving forward into new business, we have our planning uh, commission appointments. Uh, I'm thinking, Jeff, are you providing the staff report on that? It's, it's Kelly. Oh, it's Kelly. Great. Hello, Kelly. Is that an Oregon shirt? He's still, he's still, oh, yeah, it is. Still wearing you, you know, it. I'm a U of U alumni, right? Oh, <laughs> are you? Oh, be careful. I am. You know, I am. It's, it's we have some soon. beavers in here, too. It's it's too yeah. Sorry. Now, Kelly, do you, can you start with an update on our coaching go. search? Have I missed anything Myers. during the meeting? Um, I know Crystal Ball's out. I don't know anything beyond that. <laughs> 
Uh, all right. Well, you can get on with Freeport then. <laughs> Yeah, I hope they pick somebody that will stay around more than a couple of years. Um, so tonight before you is a recommendation from the interview panel, which consisted of three council members, uh, Mayor Pullian, Councillor Walker, and Council Sheldon, and also Planning Commissioner Mayton. They sat on a interview panel together on November 23rd, interviewed seven potential candidates, four of which were current members on the commission and three of which were three people that were interested in serving on planning commission. They came away from that with recommendations for the four seats being um, to reappoint Mr. Crosby to seat one, to reappoint McLean Wenzel to seat seven, and to appoint Darren Wagoner to seat two and Breezy Polian to seat three. So that's the main thing um, for your decision process tonight is um, to make a motion to select those four individuals or to have a discussion about um, the other three that also interviewed for appointment or reappointment. The second item that we wanted you to look at tonight was the term structure options. So option one um, would be a modification to the current two cohort system. So we just wanna present that as one potential option. This would move it to three cohorts um, two of the positions would expire in two years and they would have to seek reappointment at that time. The other two would expire in four years. And that way we would have three years um, of staggered appointments instead of the two. The, section, the second option, which is on page two of the staff report is to just stay with the existing structure. Um, and that would mean that the four appointments would all expire at the same time in 2025. So that's, that's really the two things that staff is seeking um, is, is appointment of four commissioners and then also to just discuss the term options and make a decision on whether you wanna go with option one, option two, or even another option if council wants to look at something else. So I'll stop there and turn it back to you, Mayor. Thank you, Kelly. Um, well, we'll go into the discussion. I'll, I'll just start as someone who was on the panel uh, for the interviews. Uh, I know what my personal kind of goals going into those interviews were, and I think it was shared kind of by the group as we went through the discussion. Uh, of course, everyone can speak up if it's not, but really my goals were to try to infuse some new blood onto our planning commission. Uh, we have a lot of counselors, and uh, I should start with just thank you to everybody who's both served on our commission and has applied to serve on our commission and service to our community it means a lot. Uh, but we have some uh, commissioners that spent a lot of years, we're talking like decades years on our planning commission. Thank you again for that. But sometimes we need new blood and new opportunity for different community members to get involved in our community. I think it also helps this council has seen a lot of new blood over the last couple of years. And I think it's done a lot of good for the way we tackle things. The second thing I wanted was experience. We also need to keep on to experience. We did do that as a panel by keeping both the chair or the current chair, uh, the most senior member on the commission, as well as uh, Commissioner Wetzel. Um, and then um, some diversity and equity as well. Uh, you know, uh, this is a commission that was pretty male um, heavy and dominant um, for a lot of years. We were able to get um, Commissioner Jan Lee on there um, this last time. Uh, but I think even in our conversations as a uh, council, it helps out a lot to have a lot of different diversity of opinion and viewpoints, whether it be age or gender or whatever else it, it may be. Uh, so those were kind of my three. I think we did a good job. We have four appointments. Uh, we get another um, a female member of our community uh, onto the commission. Uh, we retain um, with two current members on there um, and we get some new blood. So I think we kind of hit those three buckets uh, that we are going for. And, and I, I really, obviously I like our recommendations. I was one of the three. So that's kind of what I have to say about it. Well, yeah, uh, I just, I want to start off by saying thank you to the ones that are being replaced. I, like you said, that's a long time of service, and I think it should not go without being recognized and greatly appreciated. Um, on the flip side of that, I, I agree. I think that um, that there's a chance for some change and, and opportunity and, and fresh mindset, and so I'm excited about that. Um, are we going to discuss the term limits separately? 
Oh yeah, I was gonna. I was just wanting to handle this. Okay, first, let's just go on with that. Yeah, yeah. I'll leave it there. Yeah. What Rich said they, the folks that have been on there have done a fantastic job. It's really hard work, many many hours over the years, reading <laughs> four hundred to eight hundred page reports. So I really honor honor their service. Yeah. Okay. Please. Um, I guess I'm really am pleased that uh, the, the mixes of things. I know that there was uh, a, a lot of concern about just how that um, the existing older um, members were going to be released versus the, some of the newer members. And I, uh, I, in my mind, I don't mind having uh, old members taken off as long as there's the continuum of older members, people especially who've been there, you know, like Jerry Crosby. He's, I don't know how long he's been there. He's been, Audience. could be 20 yeah. uh, well before uh, Jeremy and I were on there I think so it, there is a staleness that happens when you get that many years on it uh, the, the biggest concern I had uh, when I looked at the way we were recommending and I, I want to be really careful here because it is uh, the responsibility I think of every member to be involved in community service in some way so thank you and kudos to the folks who applied I just wanted to Make sure that there was a thought given to um, some of the maybe the inexperience of some of the members we did bring on that are new, and uh, I know that there's a balance in there with older, but I, I'm also thinking about some of the uh, we have a couple individuals. I'm not picking on them. I, I want to say I appreciate their volunteer, but they are working outside of the city. Um, don't have a lot of experience in terms of some of the decisions that are being made here, so. Uh, the new eyes is a good idea, but I also wonder if there isn't some uh, issue around uh, getting ready, getting uh, understanding, putting some of these just um, very difficult, any more diff very difficult, and leading to, in some cases, court decisions that we have some of that experience in there. Uh, did you guys work your way through some of that thought process? Cool. So I guess I can only speak to like, I'll speak to the two kind of new, new members, who would be new members to the commission mm -hmm. in that group, because the others have the commission experience. You know, one is I would say um, uh, the female, I'm not great with names, the female member of the two, um, you know, she was involved in the Sandy Community Action Centers, different nonprofit Sorry. organizations yeah. in town for volunteerism. Uh, also, I believe as a mother of, what was it, six and at six. Um, and my, my mom was only a mother to three, and I can tell you the skill set and stuff that you get from having to, to balance all of the stuff that happens with that. And so with that individual, both through life experience as well as experience volunteering in the community, I feel, I personally feel satisfied. The other member was, is somebody that I am actually very proud to promote uh, to commission as well. And the reason for that is the individual had applied for the uh, a planning commission mm -hmm. position uh, previously was highly, I was on that panel as well. I think you were, so maybe, uh, was highly uh, considered for the position at that time. But what I really appreciated about this individual was, is that not only did they apply a second time, but as we all know, a lot of times they just go yeah. away forever. But this individual also, if you go, and I, and I suspect if you go right now, to your uh, to who's watching He's the city council, council meeting, meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll see that name, and you see his name at every council meeting between the last time there was the application and this time. I suspect the planning commission sees it, and so just you know, I gave kind of a deep throated answer to that, but we definitely did, you know, and even the new members I think definitely shown an ability with both past experience, life experience, as well as their willingness to get involved in the community to do that. I appreciate that, and I think that's really it makes a lot of my concerns less. Um, in the last few years, I've seen more times where the planning commission decisions have made it to the desks of the city council. Uh, some of those have been, I think, really reasonable and, and the right thing to do. And some of those have been one of those that you just wonder, you know, how, how do we get to this point without some of the work that could have happened in the trenches? So mm -hmm. I appreciate the difficulty. One of the things that having spent several years, I think four or five years on planning commission, it, it sometimes can be really a, a drudge. You mentioned several hundred pages sometimes. I remember getting uh, the preparation documents for it delivered to me in a dolly 
in my office. It you know, really heavy. <laughs> there was lots of jokes about uh, back injuries and such at that time. So I, I would say thank you again for all those folks who put their name in it. And I thank you for those who are leaving. Uh, think about the things that are happening in that. Take your job seriously. Appreciate it. And I would just respond like standard, the three of the seven are returning, you know, have been on the planning commission for for, for years. Um, one of them, then in addition, you know, of the other two, one of them was a city councilor, and the other mm -hmm. one was a on the planning commission, I think in Troutdale or somewhere. And so then that leaves, you know, the, the last two that don't have as much experience in actual planning commission, but mm -hmm. five of the seven have years of experience. So I feel like we've got that necessary kind of corporate knowledge or that, you know, land bank that we need for, for mm -hmm. covering things and keeping us well represented. Yeah, I just want to say thank you for those that will be coming off the, uh, um, I know it's a service that is a thankful, thankless job. I thank you. And I know we all thank you and other planning commissioners have gone through it. Well, thank you because it's thankless um, as one that has done it in the past and, and due to city council, which I think is very thankless a lot of times. But um, so thank you so much for that time and your energy and, and putting in, as we said, you know, over a decade um, for each individual that um, is, a, is a huge commitment. Um, so um, I do look forward. Uh, I was on the interview committee the past time with one that you were describing. And I remember once you described who that, who that was, who that was before. So um, excited to, to see them uh, come on board uh, with that because it brings uh, maybe some perspectives um, uh, that we haven't seen yet for that. But again, just thank you so much. And, and you know, I'd love to see some type of uh, a plaque or something, something that we can do to give out because that, it, you know, that's, it's in process. Okay, I just that that's uh, good. That's needed. So yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah. You need a motion? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I think there's a comment. Don, did you have some first? I was wondering procedurally, do we need to tie the motion to the options? I don't think we have to, but let's go through the options. We might okay. as well do it. Uh, so we have two options in front of us. Uh, some of you may remember the conversation we had last time, mm -hmm. kind of the onboard four and the four terms. Uh, all in the same kind of term or to stagger them a little bit. Um, what were you guys thinking of the two options that were presented in the staff report? I want to know what Rich thinks. I know. Well, that's where I was going to. <laughs> I'm going to go back to where I was originally. Um, I still think that we need to, uh, this is a great example of the staggering, right? This time we were able to keep um, some, some historical uh, knowledge on that, right? Um, this allows us to maintain that into the future, even mm -hmm. if for some reason we had to vacate all the spots, whether that be by their own choice or, or choosing right. and changing. I just think this is a um, this is a better plan, as I stated before. Um, Kelly, correct me if I'm wrong. I believe after, I don't know if it's in here, but I believe if in, after this, it goes back to the, is it four-year appointments, right? It just has two every four years. Right. When you say when you say this, is it option one or two that you're talking one, about? One. I'm sorry, option one. Yeah. Option yeah, two. That's per, I mean, that's what staff envisioned at least is that if you were to choose option one, let me just look at it here. Um, that for example, the the two seats that would expire at the end of 2023, if you reappointed those two individuals or new people to those seats, then they would be for four years at that point. So this is a two, two, three, right? Okay. Correct. That is correct. Is there any rationale for making the two newest members have to reapply? That seems the seats that they just went one, two, three, four, five. Right You're the choice. I mean, you you could easily change it. Yeah, there was there wasn't a great deal of thought. If, if the council would rather change that, that's the council's prerogative. Yeah, I think probably since he just got on. Got on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's maybe not. <laughs> let's give him a little breathing room. As the, the one guy up here who has to run every two years. <laughs> so maybe give him a little breathing room. At least there's no campaign sign. Yeah. We appreciate you. <laughs> you know, as I sit here and, and just some, just food for thought, because I'm it's this mountain we're fighting over, but um this leaves 
by doing that, this gives them a chance to just have kind of a sample taste, right, for a couple of years, and then they can make a decision whether they want to do a longer term thing. Just something to think about, where you're leaving your again your your longevity on there for the full four year term. So just. Plus, I, I'm not sold either way. I, I see value in either side. I just want to point that out. Those other people think, have think, that expectation of the term ending exactly. when it already does it too. So you'd be kind of surprising them with a shorter term. I think so. Yeah. 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 I, I, I think if a person goes through the effort and, and work and so on to be able to apply and for the first time be on there, I would imagine I, I wanted to be on there enough to be able to make it a little Yes. Let's. So yep. if you do that, let's let them. Uh, the other thing that um, I don't see it working up here is uh, when Jeremy and I were in there, there was a um, advisor, I guess we called it in the back seat someplace in case somebody had a chance to um, be sick or um, couldn't make it further and they were watching. You mean like an alternate? Yeah, it wasn't alternate. an alternate, it was an advisory uh, council member, yeah. which we had about two, sometimes three that would, if there was an opening, they would be learning. And we we referred to them and asked them, do you have any comments on this? But I was, was really on the panel point. that we just like I feel like we decided to get rid of it, but Kelly, why did we decide to get rid of it? I don't remember. I, I think it's actually still in the code. We've actually asked people in the past, like last year, whether they would want to serve on a as an advisor, and people pretty much said no. Um, however, that being said, I know one of the first tasks that um planning commission is going to be looking at in January is their bylaws and hoping to draft some bylaws that they can then forward to city council. And I think they were wanting to look at the advisor position in more detail and try to come up with um, ways to modify it slightly. So maybe it would incentivize more people to want to actually be an advisor. So Kelly, I apologize for interrupting. We'll have to double check that. I actually think that was taken out uh, in 2018. That's all right. oh. uh, but we'll need to check into that further, I think. Okay. One thing it did do was it gave somebody a chance to sit in the Take chair in those days, they weren't virtual, of course. And get experience. And get experience and understand. It was a tough one because they never really had a chance to vote. So they sat there and. Can you imagine? Yeah. So you either write it this big and yeah. you get one minute about. to say something, what your thoughts are, and that was it. So, yeah. so that was why we it was very rarely filled or people left it very quickly. Other than that, I, I like the idea of flipping, giving the, giving the people a little bit more. Of it. I was on shadow council. At least we got credit for it. That's and you guys, that was here. pretty much the gig. Yeah. Shadow council used to sit up here with us. That's right. Council. That's right. All right. Are we ready for a motion? Um, can somebody tell me what the new terms are? Oh. <laughs> can you walk them through that, Jeff? I don't know what flip meant. <laughs> so it's, it sounds like uh, if you look at the staff report under option one, that the proposal here is to make the term expiration dates for Jerry Crosby and Hollis McLean Wenzel uh, 1231-23. And then to make Darren Wegener and Breezy Poulin 1231-25. Uh, as I understand it. Okay. Correct. So yes. I'll make a motion that we do what Jeff said. <laughs> In addition to recommending that we appoint Jerry Crosby to seat one, Darren Wagner to seat two, Breezy Pullen to seat three, and Hollis McLean Wenzel to seat seven on the Planning Commission and adopt the terms as were stated previously. Second. There's a motion by Councillor Hokinson and a second by Councillor um, Smallwood. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nays. Motion carries. All right, we did it. Cool. Uh, moving forward under new business, um, comp plan consultant approval. Gordon? Yeah, and Kelly's going to present this. Um, this is a, a council goal um, to uh, update our comprehensive plan. This is the, the, the big contract approval uh, to get us uh, started and working on this, which is going to take almost, I think, two years. Um, we've talked about how big of an effort a comprehensive plan update is. So um, this is your first action, is approving the, the, the contract um, to get us going. But um, uh, Kelly and Neil will be managing the project and um, they'll get the staff report for uh, this proposal. Yeah, so before you tonight is a brief staff report with a scope of work, which is attachment A and a cost estimate of just over $250,000, which is attachment B. And so the process was, is that we put out um, an RFQ 
we got three firms, three competent firms that all submitted good proposals, 3J Consulting, Angelo Plan Group, and MIG. Um, those three proposals were scored by staff, Councillor Smallwood, and Commissioner McLean Wenzel. While all three were very good proposals, the clear winner was 3J Consulting. And um, so we told them in August that they were the clear winner, and then we entered into negotiations with them. They're also using subcontractors, Eco Northwest, Geos Institute, and Veritas collaborations. Um, so the next steps, if you were to approve the contract or approve um, the city manager to enter into a contract tonight with 3J Consulting would be that we would be working on a preliminary list of key stakeholder groups with the consultant 3J. We'd be discussing public engagement tools, which would mainly probably be for the majority through Sandy Speaks, the new engagement platform that we just launched a couple weeks ago, and then other project strategies. So the consultant typically on a big project like this, similar to a parks master plan or um, a transportation system master plan or any other large planning effort goes through data collection and analysis of existing conditions. They usually do SWOT analysis, with, which is identifying your strengths and weak, weaknesses. And then from there, you kind of get into the meat or the more fun public engagement pieces where you actually start um, designating and designing kind of the comprehensive plan and what the city is going to look like in 20 years from now. So that's kind of the big that's kind of the big takeaways in the next steps. Um, as you'll see, I, I wrote a pretty robust budgetary impact section um, that's included with the staff report as well. And just to let everybody know, attachment C is a $50,000 DLCD T TA grant we just got a few weeks ago. Um, so just to remind everybody, the city of Sandy planning staff applied for two grants. We got denied on one of them, which we, we didn't think we had much of a chance of getting, but we applied anyways. And then on the second one, we got $50,000. So that helps with budgetary reasonings or purposes. Um, so the, the consultant is on the line tonight, just listening, and they are here if you have any technical questions, both in regards to the scope of work or the budgetary memo attachment, just because they would be the best person to answer kind of the more technical questions on those. Um, but with that, we're recommending that you approve the scope of work and budget and that you assign the city manager to enter in a contract with 3J Consulting. Having been uh, part of this process, um, 3J was, uh, when Kelly said that they really stood out, they really stood out. Like they took the time to actually come out to Sandy. You could tell based on the, on the information that they gave. They understood the diversity. They understood the nature of the work. Um, they went as far as like incorporating pieces of town in their in their presentation and, and whatnot. So they they definitely I mean were a standout of, of the ones that submitted. And I think we'll do a great job. So awesome. uh, economic development plan is really heavily integrated into this as well. Mm -hmm. I see. Mm -hmm. As the analyst, so there's still uh, economic development plan coming on besides that. The the, the analyst. Am I saying that right? Yes. Yeah, the analysis. Ah, sorry, I couldn't say that. My mask was getting in the way. Um, and then, uh, thank you for laughing. Um, but, and then we have a um, the market analysis, which is, is two separate things. But with that, getting that done, putting it in place with this so that it can be used for that and then turned in will help solidify that even more. So okay. good hand in hand type of thing that we're coming from another third party. So perfect. I, I did a very imperfect uh, review of some of the work that 3J's done. I couldn't find anything wrong. So kudos to the selection. Thanks for doing that. I do have a question for the company. You said they're on the virtual meeting. Uh, in any kind of thing like this, you got a couple of years worth of work to do. Uh, other projects that are on their table sometimes get in the way and I, I don't want to know all the details of it, but what format do you guys use? And I'm talking to the contractor now uh, for being make sure that our process stays on track, doesn't get lost in the business of having to deal with other cities or other projects. Again, what's your workload? I guess analysis in a short statement for the next couple of years while you're working on the city of Sandy's. 
Good evening, uh, Mayor and Councilors. My name is Steve Faust. I'm the Community Planning Director with 3J Consulting. Uh, <clears throat> there was a little interruption while we joined the meeting as a panelist, but I think what I heard you say or ask, uh, Councilor, is um, how the rest of our workload uh, looks over the next few years and how this fits into that to make sure we have the capacity to, to work on this project. Is that correct? Yes, and one little um, addition to it is, is how do you um, determine your workload? So if you, there's bound to be times when everything is going to come due at the same time for whatever reasons, then how do you, do you structure yourself so that you don't have to end up with putting us in the second seat and allowing time to slide by? Certainly, certainly. Well, as a, as a firm, we are constantly projecting our workloads. Uh, every month we project workloads um, up to a year ahead. So uh, we're constantly making sure that the hours needed for a project, uh, we have that capacity for our team. Uh, my colleague, Anais Maté, who's uh, with me tonight, is going to be the main point of contact. Uh, she just uh, wrapped up, uh, is wrapping up a comprehensive plan update for the city of Sherwood. Uh, not too long ago, another one for the city of Redmond. So that uh, has freed up the time in her, her schedule and her workload uh, to be the main point of contact for this project. I'll say we have, we, we put together a team specifically uh, for what the city of Sandy and the RFQ was asking for. So we do have a, a bench of uh, other consultants who are gonna help with this project. Uh, so I'm quite confident that we have the capacity over the next two years to uh, to fulfill our commitment to the city. Thank you. Uh, hi, Steve. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. We look forward to working with you. Kelly, I had a question for you about the grant that we got. And um, can you see that, uh, can you send me a copy of the grant application? Um, the one thing that I had concerns about, you know, when we take money from the outside, there's sometimes strings attached. And uh, the grant folks at the um, state of Oregon LCDC said that, you know, they uh, are pleased to offer us this grant. Our proposal aligns well with the priorities established in the LCDC's grants allocation plan and other approval criteria. That makes me really kind of nervous because I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty sure I don't agree with about half of their priorities at LCDC. So if we're taking $50,000 from them, I'm, I'm worried um, if there's, you know, just what did we promise them? And uh, yeah. What did we give away? <laughs> yeah, right. So um, I'd like a copy of the grant to be sent out to the city council, if you could, just to make sure that we're all understanding what their expectation is and whether or not, you know, hopefully there's not too many strings attached to it, but if they are, I, I want to kind of know know that going in. Yeah, I'd be I'd be happy to do that. What I can tell you is I've worked with um, Gordon Howard, who's the Community Services Divin Division Manager. Uh, actually, I worked with him very closely on our buildable lands inventory in 2015, and then in 2017 on our, our UGB expansion. Because at that time, he was actually in a different position at DLCD. He was in a lower position, and um, so he he helped me and the regional representative at the time, Jennifer Donnelly, quite a bit. And I mean, I thought he was actually excellent to work with and very flexible. So um, I am pretty confident that he'll be pretty easy to work with and that I think that they will award us the grant money with very little, if any, strings attached. Um, but I, I can certainly send you what we sent them. Great, thank you. I have that same pet peeve with grants uh, and all the boards I serve on. I'm that guy. So I definitely understand. Um, all right. If there's no other discussion, is there a motion for adoption? I move that we direct the city manager to enter in a contract with 3J Consulting to update the city's comp plan as recommended in the staff report. Second. There's a motion by uh, Councillor Exner and a second by Councillor Walker to uh, to move forward. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nays. Motion carries. Um, just on a personal note, this is a big deal. Mm -hmm. 
And I'm just uh, it's very, very happy to see us moving forward with our comp plan. It's something that I know has been talked about a lot in this community with how quickly we're growing and it's a big accomplishment. So thank you for your work on the grants, Kelly, moving us forward in this direction. Appreciate it. I had one little um, comment. The list of attachments in our staff report, I don't know if anybody had trouble yeah. opening them. I couldn't. And so I, I'd ask that Jeff send, send us out the actual, I, mm -hmm. I, I asked for it and got it. Um, but it would be really important, I think, for all of us to be get familiar with this comp plan scope work, the budget, and the word letter. I just kind of gave you this. Anyway, click on it. Ask you don't have permission to get to it. Yeah, it's that right. compass yeah. thing or something like that. Yeah, so. I appreciate the feedback. We'll make sure that doesn't happen. What what it was supposed to be was uh, one of those internal links that just jumps you to another part of the PDF. Mm -hmm. Didn't work correctly, so we'll make sure that doesn't happen. <laughs> yeah. so. But it is going to be important. They are in the packet. To, yeah. All that info is in the packet. Yep. It's okay. just that the, the quick links okay. didn't work. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> All right, moving forward. Uh, that's a great one. Police. Uh, Thanks, Kelly. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. Uh, police body and uh, warn cameras update and purchase authorization. Hey, Chief. Hey. Chief Roberts is here tonight. I'll let I don't want to. Uh, I'll let him do most of the talking. We don't get to see him very often, so <laughs> he's here tonight to share the news here. Yeah, all these in person. Um, but uh, yeah, please. Uh, um, he's here tonight to give you an update on the, the police body cameras uh, project. Um, Council recalls funding in the last budget cycle, so he's going to provide an update on that and a request uh, for the council to authorize uh, the purchase for body worn cameras. Yeah, thank you, Tyler. Uh, Jordan, appreciate it. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, an update for you on this. Um, if all of you remember, they were uh, in on this uh, project from the beginning. I provided a quote for the budget committee um, for uh, $71,000 for this project. At the time, it was for you know, all the um, cameras and the equipment. And before that quote, before I got that quote, I worked with IT and uh, our IT department, and it was thought that we could do this project on, on our own premises with our own server storage uh, capabilities that we have currently. Um, after uh, having several more meetings with the provider and IT, we found out that just wasn't possible. Now, without increasing our um, either purchasing more servers and that cost was more than what we could do um, with uh, having this uh, all on the cloud storage. The cloud storage, of course, comes with cost, but it's uh, CGIS, um, it meets all the CGIS standards, which is the criminal justice information systems. We have to be compliant with all their standards. It meets that, they manage it. And uh, it will also, with a new software update, it will also, They'll also be able to integrate our in-car camera systems of the seven that we have that are the older systems. With a software update, we can bring those on the new system as well. And cool. without having to purchase new cameras for those cars we already have in there. The actual cost for the in-car video systems is a lot more than, say, a body camera cost just for the equipment. It's just a lot more. And the installation is also more to put those in the cars. So that helps bringing those systems along and saves us from buying more cameras for the vehicles. And this project does include seven more of those in-car systems new for our remaining fleet that doesn't have these systems in there. So basically we have about half of our patrol fleet right now, as you probably already knew, that has these in-car video systems and half that doesn't. So we needed to bring that in. And that was just, a, that was a project some years ago and a goal for us to outfit the rest of those. So that will take care of this as well. Um, I also want to apologize for the, the staff report. Uh, there's a, I was working on a timeline with Motorola Solutions for this to give all of you. And they gave me the timeline right after the staff report was published. So I couldn't put it in there after the fact, but I do have that uh, from them. And um, it's basically in a nutshell, about four months from the time I make the, if we make this purchase order, it would be about four months be, for everything to be installed, the equipment, everything to be here. And within that time, you know, we'll work out the policy updates and things like that. And the training as well, this includes the training, they'll come out and train all their people on this equipment. 
And so sometime in early spring, I would think that we would have a like a, a pilot a project with a few out in the field at first to test it. And then by summer, I think we could be all up and running on the whole project. So awesome. I apologize that I didn't get in there, but those people got that to me just like on Thursday. So I wasn't able to put that in the report. I'm surprised with four months. I would have, I was thinking you were gonna say 12 months because being no. in the business myself of not the police business, but the tech business, I'm waiting for things for a year, nine months uh, before we have a date to ship. So that's good. I really appreciate uh, moving to the cloud uh, for a lot of reasons. It brings the technical debt of in-house uh, training as well as the long-term support of it. Um, and that's where we should be going. Uh, so I appreciate that change and going forward with it. And um, I'm surprised, I'm not surprised that the cost has gone up since the original because, well, everything has gone up. I mean, I just, we can sit here all night and later and I can tell you about all the things in tech that I'm dealing with that um, across the board um, is uh, going. So actually, I wouldn't have been surprised if it was even more so. But I appreciate the, yeah. the the equipment itself. If I may, just really quickly, really wasn't uh, there wasn't a large increase in equipment. Most of this cost, as you can, it's in the storage, uh, the cloud storage, and the ongoing cost of that. Um, so yeah, the equipment itself didn't, it went up a bit, but not not significantly. It was just the change in having to go to the cloud instead of being able to manage this on our own servers. And I, I think also will reduce time for uh, our IT department. We have uh, Scott Jones who works with us at the police department. Um, and he's, we keep him very busy with that. So this won't be something that he'll have to manage. Correct. And um, included in this is the redaction software for our evidence uh, technician. That's crucial right now, our evidence technician with the old system manually um, redacts um, you know, just manually has to redact everything from our video from our cars, which is time consuming. With the redaction software, it's much quicker and easier. Um, it will require, this also will require someone to, there's gonna be more evidence um, technician time involved. And right now our records manager is our evidence technician. We do have a, um, a spot that's still open in our police department that will We'll have somebody move from our records department. One of our records technicians, we've already started this process, will um, half time will be spent eventually as an evidence technician. So it, it also provides them an opportunity which they're excited about to do something a little bit different and to uh, get trained in another field, so to speak. And uh, we've started a vetting process for that already too, which is a, a plus for our department. Uh, yeah, Kathleen. So, um, thanks, Ernie. This is a great update. Um, the confusion I have is that the five-year cost for the camera equipment and storage is one hundred seventeen thousand eight hundred three, and so are we paying? I mean, I you know we had allocated the seventy-one thousand, I guess, for mm -hmm. our two-year biennium budget, and so are we paying all that one hundred seventeen in this biennium? And then getting it free for the next three years after that, or um, it, it, that's that's my concern is you know come, yeah, is, yeah. where do we that's fill the good, hole of the other forty thousand plus dollars, and uh, and and what kind of, you know usually you don't pay for services five years ahead of time. Um, yeah, that's yeah. a good question, Council Walker. Thank you for reminding me. I wanted to get to that too. But, um, so obviously when I when we figured this out, this cost and figured out how much this was gonna be, I knew we didn't have that those amount of funds that were budgeted to us uh, from the budget committee. I, I had a meeting with uh, city manager Wheeler and deputy city manager Deems, and we were um, we gave them an update. And this is something that we, we will pay upfront. So the whole cost, and that will cover everything for that five year, years. Now, after, after the five year period is done, then we'll have to renew this contract. Obviously, we won't need the equipment and things like that, but there will be an ongoing cost after that. And most of that will be storage. Um, so some good news, we, we can absorb this in the police budget now. So we're not, I'm not seeking additional funding from council. Um, that 
the reason we're able to do that is we're we're budgeted in our salary line item for full staff, which we're not right now. We're still in the process of hiring. So we still got two, we're still two people short. And so we haven't been using that. And so um, after that meeting, we we um, we discovered we could we could absorb this in our budget. It won't take any more, and we'll just we'll pay the entire amount up front. And then that'll that'll take us through the whole five year period. And also during that five year period with this contract, there's gonna be a new body camera out in mm -hmm. I think they said two and a half years. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a new model with new software. Um, they will come out, exchange those, upgrade the software. It's all included in this, so there's not any. You know, if something goes wrong with it, it's they'll take care of it with this. We won't have to ship a camera in and get a new one. They'll just come out and replace these things if we need to do that. Yeah, Carl. Um, a little bit of background. I is, um, I'd love to get into the cruisers and have a chance to do a little um, ride along in that, but I have to confess it's been about six, seven months since I've done one of those. And last time I did that, uh, the uh, in-car uh, cameras uh, didn't evaluate or didn't read the license plate numbers that the officers were reading, and they were typing in the license plate numbers as they were driving along and checking out cars and such. I, is this uh, improvement in the camera and the, and the vehicles and uh, the cruisers take care of that, or so are we still? These are body cams. Yeah, well, so it's it's in camera. Oh, and vehicles. Yeah, so it it doesn't doesn't it is, it, so I'm sorry. Right, to answer your question, uh, they cool. they don't read the license plate. Now there there is technology to right. do that to um, have those on. Um, I believe you know, Councilor Sheldon's probably really familiar with that technology. I think some of the. Uh, uh, their vehicles have that technology. It's a completely different system. That's a license plate reader. Right. Um, takes that information and puts it inputs it into the uh, the uh, CAD program automatically. But uh, this does not do that. It's just okay. it's just strictly uh, video and audio. For the actions to the windshield, I take it you see those on YouTube and well, yeah, some and idiots the back, chasing there's, the car. There's around. multiple cameras in the car. There's um, you know facing out, and there's also um, the one that faces back to okay. from the back seat when you have uh, someone in the back, to, and also recording the wall. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess I would encourage you to look that direction because it, um, there's so many things going on in a in that vehicle at any one time. I mean, you're sitting there, you're listening to the radio, you're watching the cars, you're checking out. And the officer has always got just his full attention on all kinds of things to add to it. Typing in the license plate number on that computer is seemed like an awful lot to add on to it. It'd be a great advantage, I would think, to not have to deal with that. Seems like that would be it. I don't know if it's a really expensive system to have it those is. cameras added to the vehicle. Right now, the technology, it may, it may get cheaper over time, of course, you, these things do, but. Right now, it's um, to to outfit a vehicle for all those really expensive. I don't get it though. Okay. You know, Facebook can read my face. <laughs> I know you. Yeah. You know, but we can't. We can't read the license plate. Uh, I'm sure it'll yeah. go down in the future. It's something it's, we can look yeah. into. But uh, yeah. you know, yeah. my my folks uh, are are really excited about this project. Mm -hmm. They want the cameras. Yeah, I mean, sure. uh, oh, yeah. they really do. Uh, most agencies in Clackamas County are going to this. They have projects already ongoing in or some are in the testing phase already, some are completed. Sure. So um, my, my, my officers are excited about it. I think our community, um, you know, they, this, is, this is something that's important to them. Yeah, yeah. great. Absolutely. So. All right, with that, let's do it. Is there a motion? I move to authorize purchase of body cameras, body worn cameras, vehicle cameras, and five-year agreement for associated services and cloud-based storage. There a second. I'll second that. Motion by Councillor Exner and a second by Councillor Pietzold. Um, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nays. Motion carries. Awesome. Uh, this is another big goal of councils and past councils. So uh, congratulations, everyone. Uh, thank you, thank Chief. You, Appreciate, Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Remember when you got the first seven cameras and talking about that, you were over at the library still. <laughs> the uploading of the, uh, the files when you came up there, you know, it was a big deal back then. Yeah. Yeah. Tell your guys not to forget to remind the hose draggers that they're they're filming so we don't say anything <laughs> dumb. <laughs> oh, dumb or, uh, <laughs> yeah, I love that. Uh, red light on the show. All right. Oh, like your folks would ever do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
Uh, Jordan, the spotlight's on you, buddy. All right, thanks, Mayor Council. Um, just brief reports tonight. Uh, we extended recruitment for a standing net utility worker. Um, you know, I, I only I bring these up just to keep you informed of our recruitment. Um, you know, we got this recruitment for the standing net utility worker. We also have uh, police recruitments underway, which they're in the interview process and background checks on a couple. So we're, we're continuing to move forward with those. But you know, labor shortages and also uh, sort of the employment economy right now are affecting us. Um, we extended the application period for the utility workers. We did not get any applicants, and so. Our, our search continues um, for filling positions. Um, on that, uh, the public works director, um, I, I don't have a detailed update for you other than uh, we're continuing to, to work on this um, and, and work with uh, at least one candidate who was part of the pool. Um, and then I'm also exploring some other options in terms of interim. Um, so uh, stay tuned. We're I'm consuming a lot of my time right now. In, in, um, figuring out how to, how to fill that cr crucial position and other positions in that department. Um, uh, some bit of good news, I wanna congratulate Tyler for the popular annual uh, financial reporting award from the GFOA uh, for the report that he put together um, for our last uh, fiscal year, 19 uh, and 20. He's still doing an award show for that, <laughs> pre-show and the whole deal. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations, Tyler. It's <laughs> outstanding, good job. Um, <laughs> I think, uh, one of the, the the things I like to highlight about this reward in particular is um, unlike the budget and the CAFR, we actually don't have to do a popular annual financial report, but Tyler chooses to do so, uh, not just to get a, awards, but also. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 the, it's the award show, it's just so fun. Um, but, but to, um, you know, it's, it's one of the, the things that JLFOA has as a best practice to help um, the public understand more about how city finances are. So um, just kudos to Tyler for, for taking that on um, on his own uh, and, and putting together uh, that report and getting the award for it. Um, one of the things I did want to bring to your attention, and I will share this if you haven't seen it, is uh, some legislative concepts that Congressman um, Blumenauer and uh, Senator Wyden has been working on in terms of the Mount Hood um, National Forest. Uh, you know, I just received this today. Uh, you may have received it as key stakeholders in the area. Um, you know, they sent it to us because, you know, Sandy is the gateway to Mount Hood. Um, it's too early to say if, if any of these will directly impact Sandy. I think the, the big um, indirect impacts are traffic, tourism, um, things that they're proposing up there in terms of uh, designating more wilderness areas, uh, the wild and scenic or recreational river um, as sand, at portions of the Sandy River, which we have an interest in obviously uh, with where those uh, boundaries are in regards to our proposal for the Sandy River discharge. But um, I, I also shared it with PacWest if they had any input on that as well, um, in addition to our wastewater team. But I'll, I'll, sh I'll share it with you. Um, we can have a, a further discussion about it if there's any input that we want to provide or the council wants to provide. Um, as the governing body back to uh, the representative and, and senators that are, are working on this. Um, these are just concepts. There's a, a map they included too that kind of has all the different designations and what they propose for, for trails and, and all that. Um, but we haven't seen any proposed legislative you know, language. It's just the concepts at this point. It's Congressman Blumenauer and Senator Sarah White. White. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then it just finally a reminder that uh, no council meeting on December 20th. Um, so thank what? you for the mayor uh, <laughs> clearing the, the agenda for that to have a little break um, uh, for Christmas. But, still got some sweat. <laughs> but, but the trade off is that we will have a work session next Monday. Um, the planning commission has been invited to okay. that meeting. Um, it's about the, the bypass feasibility study and then the TSP um, priorities to give and so take. Is. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> But uh, that's it for me. Thank you. <laughs> you just dropped that. <laughs> nice. Uh, Don. Well, um, I will be out of town next Monday. So I'll just start my report with that. And I'll be traveling. So unfortunately, unable to attend. Uh, I could make the 20th. You know, just. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to say thanks. The Christmas lighting uh, was fun. A lot of people, I think it was, uh, I think what we're seeing is people wanting to get out and about again and giving them uh, opportunity to do so, especially in a, in a safe and a way is, is really smart. So say thanks for that. 
Uh, as we look forward to doing that again in the future, I'd say let's get the choir mic. If we have a choir or whoever's performing, let's make sure we've got enough mics to to make it to make it sound professional enough for a city that's growing as fast as ours and as big as ours. But uh, DJ was definitely loud and you could hear him. And, and Mary, we could hear you. Did you so, see me dance into it? I, I tried not to look. There were some good moves. <laughs> Come on, Don. There were some good moves out there. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Uh, I also want to say thanks. I love the town with the, this time of year with the lights on the trees and everything. It looks really good. It's But I, I want us to continue to remember the impact light has on the mood and what you think of a town, right? Something as simple as putting a few dollars of lights on a tree makes makes you think there's something special there like okay that there's shops or restaurants or places that i want to go and, and i think we need to think about that light strategy not just street lights but we'll all cut as we look to to build that, that mm -hmm. future vision of what we want that downtown corner to look like the petf the the pool task force they're working on the recommendation that should be reported to the council in january I'd like to thank Jeff for fixing my chair. It's, it's, it sits up enough. It doesn't sink. That's that's. In, I appreciate that. And lastly, it was a chair of humility. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, and the last one, uh, we've got some new engagement software. I'd love to have maybe a demo. If we have one of those light days, one of them coming up that you could tell us how it works and what we can expect from it. So thanks. Thank you, Carl. Yeah, a couple, three things here. Um, I have been on the TSP uh, committee for the last two times that it's been in progress. And I just want to say to Kelly, if you're still listening, uh, what a great job that is. They are really in some detail and you're going to see a lot of the detail of that on Monday. I think that's where we're planning on having it displayed to the council. Really an excellent, um, well depth um, in in inventory of the whole uh, process around Sandy and I appreciate that. So I'm looking forward to having the council see that thing. Uh, I had a chance to talk with uh, Rochelle, the new uh, uh, Parks and Recreation Director, a sharp, sharp individual. I'm really pleased with a lot of her understanding and skills and the things that she is uh, certainly aware of um, how to do her or a business in her, in her work job. So I'm sure she has a lot of ideas that she'll be sharing with us as we go along. Uh, a really good pat on the back of Public Works. They fixed a, uh, really, I thought a, a pretty substantial problem. Of, and I hate to say it was in front of my house, but it was also on Langan's end. So there's a lot of truck traffic that we seem to still continue to get there. I see trucks. I have no idea where they're going to or coming are coming from the highway, obviously, but what they plan to do when they go down Langan's Sand, we're talking about uh, semi trucks, you know, cattle trucks. It just seems like there's, we ought to be thinking about what we're doing on some of these roads that aren't designed to have the heavy traffic on them. They turn right and go down to Barco, I've seen. Is that where they're going to? Yeah, they go to 211. What, are they trying to miss the downtown traffic or something, I suppose? And anyway. Appreciate, yeah, that could be that too. Uh, appreciate the public works, did a great job, by the way. I kind of whined about some of the repairs that we're not doing so well over on McCormick and they came back and the road's in great shape. So good job there. Um, Want to make sure, uh, Mayor, that you know that um, I'm not attending any of the economic development meetings. And so um, if it's Something you want to make sure that an additional council stays on that position. So we'll have three on that. Um, I, I just, the conflict I have is, is that I have the, um, the aquatics is always in exactly the same time. So can't attend that meeting. So I see where your priorities lead. That's yeah, <laughs> I have to say. <laughs> they bring cookies. I, we're going to be swimming I'm soon. Just <laughs> so uh, I don't know if I need to extend my um, resignation or you want to just do something to put somebody else in that position okay. or whatever that All right. next step is. So, and then finally, um, I want to look at the city and the staff and say, what a horrendous year this has been. My goodness, there's all the work that's been done in this last 12 months, 11 months, if you want to call it that way. Um, we used to do a employee recognition and the COVID got in the way and all that. And I, I get the part that we probably wouldn't do it right away, but I'd sure like to see us put something in the future plan for doing some sort of employee recognition. Mm -hmm. 
because we have worked their buns off. We are a high energy council. We really have pushed people along. And um, I just want to say thank you for all the hard work. And um, if I have to, I'll apologize for all the snide comments I've made in the last whatever number of months. Appreciate that. And then finally, um, I was talking with uh, Rochelle a little bit. We were talking about volunteers. We've also had a volunteer potluck in the past. Uh, uh, don't, um, what is it? Uh, uh, hot dogs and hamburgers, I think yeah. what it is, and hand out a bunch of pins to help them feel like they are recognized. Should do that too. We should recognize our volunteers. Even in this COVID where things are slowed down a little bit for the volunteer world, those who are volunteering are really working very difficultly. So with that, I'm done. Great. Thank you, Carl. Great suggestions. Um, Kathleen. Yeah, thanks, uh, Carl. You kind of hit on one of the ones I had here too about the kind of, it, it, we, we, I mean, and I've been involved for years and stuff, but it usually wasn't, you know, a Christmas or holiday party because the rates were too high. So they would have it in like January, February to kind of get cheap rates somewhere. But it is important to recognize our wonderful employees that we have and come together and have a little bit of a uh, kind of some recognition and, and appreciation there. So um, I want to thank uh, the Breakfast with Santa uh, stand-in uh, event that we had on uh, Saturday at the over by the movie theater. There was um, it was horrible weather, but there were still quite quite a few folks there. And um, all the volunteers that helped made that happen to raise money for the Meals on Wheels were, um, it was a wonderful effort. And thanks to the employees, uh, Rochelle and uh, Carol Cohen and Sarah Richardson, Olga Gerberg, all those folks and all the volunteers that they had to make that happen. That was great. And I noticed they gave you a really important job. You were one of the weights on one of the corners of those. I was, oh, <laughs> no, I had to go grab my job. blowing over. Hold the tent down because the tent was blowing uh, over. Nice. But, um, so I no, found a good was, job uh, to I was do. handing out cookies. It was great. <laughs> okay. um, I do want to make sure that um, our both well, Sandy Net and economic development meetings are being filmed are zoomed recorded somehow. When I look at the re recent meetings that we've had, you know, library, parks and all those are all recorded and yet those are not. So there should be no excuse to why the Sandy Net folks can't can't technically record the meeting on there. The library so, folks have some some room. But there's for, no policy that they are recorded though. Right? That's the thing. I understand it's not a policy. But yeah, they are public meeting. Yeah. They're a they public are, meeting, but yeah. there's no policy in a law that says that they need to be recorded. That was going to be my answer. Too. I understand. That's, I'm just requesting that that happen, or I can come to the meeting and possibly you're violate more welcome the, to come to the meeting. Yeah, and I can do that. I just, you know, don't want to. It's it's much easier for all of us probably mm -hmm. if if I don't come to the meeting and I just you know listen to it and I just you know want to be I want to understand what all's going on at those meetings as do some other people I would imagine so um, if that's a problem let me know and uh, yeah um, there is the library folks are are um, for their December meeting kind of putting together all the list of programs that they they're offering um, which is a huge huge list. I want to thank uh, Rochelle for she's starting to work on a technical advisory committee for options, uh, including the community campus park. The um, idea that we're going to have even more wilderness than we already have um, up near us, I, I will tell you just from an economic development standpoint that in wilderness, you're limited to 12 people or less. There's huge amounts of restrictions that you can do in wilderness. And while we can all debate the you know wonderful aspects of limiting timber harvesting and all making everything when we when we have such an importance um, that recreation plays in our tourism when you make everything wilderness and when you look at a map already you've got the bull run watershed nobody nobody gets in there you've got the mount hood the salmon huckleberry the um hatfield uh the uh one this over by s clackamas um the i mean anyways just about everything that you can draw a circle around that's basically a day use drive within Sandy is wilderness, which means limited use, do, doing any kind of trails or bridges or anything like that, a huge effort to, to add additional facilities. You can't have ro you know, roads, no campgrounds, nothing like that. So the idea that we're gonna put even more wilderness out there is something that I don't, really support from the tourism and you know addressing the huge growing recreation demand that we have 
on the Mount Hood National Forest being an urban forest. So get off my soapbox on that, Tommy. Amen. To I'm, I'm with you on it. Uh, um, uh, Rich, yeah. Hey, I just want to, I know it's been said a lot, so I'm going to keep it really short, but I just want to say thank you to everyone that put on the Christmas tree lighting and all the other mm -hmm. events that we've done. So um, thank you again. Uh, lastly, uh, I, I want to echo, I think the employee recognition uh, is something that we should really prioritize, especially right now. Uh, I think it's really important to re remember retention over recruitment. Sometimes I think it's better. So uh, again, that's all I got. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Rich. Uh, Lord. All right, um, Kathleen already talked about the the event up for Mills on Wheels this weekend, so I won't uh, I won't reiterate. But everybody did a great job. It was cold. I felt bad for the little kids out there in their little Christmas outfits, you know, with Santa and the Grinch. But but it was good. So uh, no sitting on his lap though. Kudos to all those guys. So um, the parks is not meeting for in the month of December, so I won't have anything really to report this month on them. Um, couple just little kind of housekeeping things one are we working to maybe trespass the individual that's sleeping in front of mountain mocha every night every night i was every single i was night. i was i was contacted <laughs> by the property owner oh you were the weekend okay yeah okay same yeah the same individual yeah yeah whatever it is yeah just that 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 person's been trespassing a lot of different places i know and, I, and uh, I know he just relocates. And I, I have to look in our system to see if there's been trespassed in that location. And of course, it's up to the owner if they want them to trespass. Right. So, um, I just I just didn't know. If, and I if, don't know if that person has requested that we do that. So I, I can check with I can mention that email. Uh, yeah, chief property owner has reached out. We'll, I'll be in touch. Right. Yep, cool. Perfect. Um, and then Jordan, regarding uh, the work session earlier, if you maybe in your next manager's report or, you know, if you get some free time, mm -hmm. right, um, you know, over the next couple of weeks, send council a list of, of maybe uh, a needs list for employees uh, in some areas so that we kind of have an idea yeah. of, of where you may be looking to, to staff some people, even if it's like stuff that, hey, we can't really afford right now, but uh, we are growing. Yep. And these are some pretty big projects that we have coming up. And so, you know, if we need to up staff in some places, then we need to figure out how to do that. So, yeah, appreciate to support that. You. Yeah. Um, in, internal, uh, just a quick response. In, internally, yeah. we have been working on it. I, I've called it Level at Sandy as the plan, but I'm sure. Um, I've been trying, yes, in the free time to build this uh, framework for, for what. I said free time lightly. Yeah. No, but it, it is a priority for me to kind of outline that for. I'm council. sure it is. It so. is also a council goal um, in terms of, uh, especially with resources and recognizing, um, you know, uh, the other opportunities out there to increase resources to meet the service demands. And so trying to marry those two in terms of how do we operationally um, meet, you know, the requirements that our systems now have on us, <clears throat> recognizing that, you know, we're being, there's more demands on us and there's sure. more projects. Absolutely. It's going to take more staff to, to accomplish that to the yeah. level that we, we expect. So. Thank you for that. Yeah, yeah, I want to support you. So get us get us a list. Um, and then um, do we have anybody going to school board meetings? I'm supposed to. Are you Quite failing? Often, Are you no, failing? He's on like six, he's on like six committees. <laughs> I'm totally oh my gosh. Okay. No, no, I was just curious. Yeah. I, just yeah. Curious. Yeah. 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 I know you got a ton of stuff going virtual. on. Yeah. I, I went to a couple, but then we've had some conflicts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get it. I yeah. trust me, I get it. So I was just curious. I hadn't heard anything, so I was curious what was going on. I have on. reached out to the chair and a couple of others and let them know. Okay. And then my my last thing, and maybe get with you at some point. I I, I had this like we should do a Christmas parade. I was thinking that too. I we should Christmas. do a Christmas parade, and you know maybe the maybe the uh, Sandy Mountain Festival group would like to tackle a winter parade or something. But we should do that on, and then do a Christmas tree lighting. Let's see what my next year looks like. Saturday. But maybe next year, my whole life will be dedicated towards Christmas and Sandy. But uh, <laughs> anyway, I just thought I was thinking the other day. Uh, some friends of mine were posting pictures. I realized it's in Eastern Oregon, so you get better weather. But just a really cool parade that. That Redmond does, yeah. and I thought, man, we could we could do that so easy through yeah. through Sandy. So cool. just something. Maybe, 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 maybe not something Highway Twenty Six. Maybe we may have to pivot around. Maybe that, pleasant. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, something to think about. Yeah. And I'm I done. It. I love it.
All right, uh, I won't rehash a lot of what you guys have already said, um, but uh, we had the tickle trot. I think it was the 10th annual, if I recall, and they do raise money uh, for uh, Action Center. I don't know how much they raised this year, but uh, every bit helps. Uh, but really great uh, seeing several people out there. I saw Stan and his family. We out almost there. had you this year, Pete told me. <laughs> yeah. I don't know when you started that. No, we always turn around <laughs> really early. I was going to say, I didn't see you. No, we always turn around early, and then as they come back, we like, now we're in second. Now we're in third. <laughs> okay, that's weird. That's weird. Uh, but uh, just a great thing that happens every year for a great cause and, and working off the, the pre-Turkey dinners. But um uh, People travel from all over the east side here to come to that one little, you know, thing. I know from rain groups, but uh, because they love that Tickle Creek Trail and uh, the, just the community atmosphere there. So, anyways, a uh, uh, great community thing. Um, the Sandy Robotics team. Uh, I my son is kind of joining this, so that's why I mentioned it a couple of weeks ago. But um, did very well and won a couple of different things down in West Salem this last Saturday. Uh, but I bring that up because they're having their big event in January here in Sandy. And it's one of the biggest ones in the center state uh, that they always have. And, and uh, we know from many years, I think it's the 12th or 13th annual event, or it's been going on for robotics in Sandy for that long, I should say. Uh, but when I helped judge at the last one, uh, people from all over Washington and Oregon love that particular uh, venue that comes down. So we're looking at over 60 teams uh, represent from all over. So hopefully they'll be shopping. Well, I know they will be because we did it down in Salem out for lunch and other places. Um, but they are looking for uh, some judges and those type of things. It's an all day event when you do that. But uh, very, very cool what these kids do and, 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 uh, and uh, how they get to uh, grow up in some of these talents that are merging in the world. So anyways, if you have a chance to even come and check it out. Uh, Saturday? Oh, no, this one's in January. And I forget the date in January, but uh, we can bring that back. So, anyway. Cool. Uh, yeah, Tickle Trot was great. Uh, it's always my, like, I always super regret it because I watch holiday movies the night before and drink too much holiday cheer. And then the alarm clock goes off super early and I regret it. And then I show up and I think, why would I ever regret wanting to do this? You know, the whole community turns out. It's always a super special event. It's not part of what you do. I understand why it might not be, but you should think about it. It is, it is definitely an event worth a uh, while. Tree lighting was great this year. Thank you to our city staff and volunteers and local business owners. There's a lot of entities that come together to make that event happen uh, from the NAPS, um, you know, uh, donating the tree and uh, everything, uh, public works, everything. So a uh, great event every year. I agree. I've, I've continually said, you know, the event's wonderful. We could just continue to take it up a notch more and more of the microphones. That's just, it would be an added plus. Uh, the comp plan, uh, I mean, just look at this month, you guys, what we're doing. Uh, this comp plan was a big moment, as we talked about earlier. Uh, we have our transportation systems plan work session that's coming up on uh, next Monday. That's going to be a lot of stuff. The police body cams, long-term uh, goal. We got a lot going on. Um, and I just want to say, um, this is kind of the one-year mark. Uh, maybe the start was a little bit on edge for everybody, but I'm really proud of this council and how we've come together as really as a team and as a working unit over the last year. Um, I hope that I've built trust uh, with all of you. I know you've certainly built a lot of trust in how I feel about all of you. Um, and I just I really appreciate the service that everybody's doing for our community. Uh, think about possibly uh, uh, doing a one year goal setting. Let me know if that's something. It wouldn't be a full blown goal setting, but kind of reviewing what we've have done. I know when I first came on council, I liked doing that one year in because you're kind of a different counselor a year in than you are when you first come in, you know, and it kind of changes your perspective or maybe it reinforces or maybe you're looking at some different things or maybe you're prioritizing things differently based on what you learned. So something to think about uh, that now that we're a year in. And then I just want to close on uh, just Greg Brewster tonight. Um, man, have we been blessed as a community with leaders of Sandy Net uh, from beginning to end. And I know when um, 
uh, but we had the changeover that brought on Greg. It's like, you know, uh, we were losing out on someone who's just been spectacular and standing at Greg's a little younger in age, you know, and I thought I was like, what? oh, you know, what's going to happen here? holy smokes you know he's just done a phenomenal job i think that was on display tonight in his preparation and i just as someone who's kind of watched that happen i'm just i'm really proud of him and that and mm -hmm. and really just uh and you jordan and, and and your leadership team quite honestly at the city and how you really work with our employees and stuff and, and the leadership and how they progress in their job so really proud of our community tonight guys we're really doing a good job so thank you everybody with that i'll adjourn our meeting Thank you.